Would you knowingly give your authority and your power to an enemy? I don't believe you would. We're talking about Satan's power and where he gets it. And I'm telling you that he's getting it from you, and I think you don't know that he's getting it from you. Now, that's what we're going to talk about. I want us to go to Revelation, the 12th chapter. You see, we're talking about where Satan gets his power. Now, I want to read a scripture here, several scriptures, that actually in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, someone said, oh, now, Brother Caps, you just can't understand the book of Revelation. Well, you can if you get the right understanding of what you're reading. Some of these chapters are informational chapters. Chapter 12 of Revelation is an informational chapter. It's not in the sequence of which it takes place. Now, if you read it, with the thought in mind that, well, now chapter 1, 2, and 3, and so on, are all in sequence, then you're going to really get confused. But I want us to notice some things about Satan that it says here about the enemy. Verse 7, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against the angels. Now, let's just stop there for just a minute. You know, people will say, well, now this is going to happen. This is in the future. This is going to happen one of these days way out in the future. But no, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is an informational chapter. This has already taken place. Now, you need to understand that before you can grasp the true meaning of what is being said here. This has already taken place. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now remember the angels, a third part of the angels, fell with Satan or went together with him and they were cast out of heaven. This is telling you how it happened. Now notice it says, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now notice it didn't say which was so strong until the whole world had to fall under his power. That's not what it said. It said deceiveth the world. Satan's power is in his deception. Now notice that it says he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Well, now, this has already taken place. Satan is on the planet Earth. I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but I mean, it's time you did notice it because Satan is on the planet Earth. Now, someone wrote a book and said Satan's alive and doing well on the planet Earth. Well, he is alive on the earth, but he's not doing well. I disagree with that. I disagree with the title. The book was all right, but I disagree with the title. Satan is in more trouble than he's ever been in in all of his days. And I'll tell you, his days are numbered. He has cast out into the earth. Well, now, that's the time that we're talking about right now. Now, this is not something that's going to happen way out in the future, not something going to happen after the rapture, not something going to happen way later on. This is what it is right now. Satan is cast out into the earth. It says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Now notice, you see, the Bible says that he's the accuser of the brethren. Now some of you thought that he's still up there accusing us before God day and night. No, he's been cast out of there. He's lost his authority. He's lost his power there. And you need to know that. The accuser of the brethren is what he's called, and he's been cast out. He is not able to go there before the presence of God daily and accuse us before God. Thank God that he's been cast out into the earth. Now, as we look at this, you realize that Satan has lost his foothold. Now, I realize and I know that some of you think, well, now I understood that to mean that this is going to happen way out in the future because Revelation is a book of the future. Well, part of it is, part of it's not. It's an informational chapter here. Now, go back to verse 10, and I'll prove this to you. I heard with a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength. Now, just ask yourself, has salvation come? Yeah, it's come. Then it's already happened, hasn't it? Now is come salvation. And now is come strength. Now notice it didn't say, now the devil's got stronger. 
because he's cast down to the earth. Now, that's kind of what we've read into that. And I tell you, that's what got some of you in trouble right now. You thought the devil got stronger when he was cast out into the earth. No, 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 no. Uh, the devil didn't get stronger. We got stronger because salvation, deliverance, preservation, healing, and soundness came to the believer, and strength came to the believer, and the kingdom of our God. Now, somebody said, now, Brother Caps, that has to mean that when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom on earth, because that's when the kingdom of God is going to come. Well, now, I beg to differ with you because the Bible says something different from that. See, I'd like to go by what the Bible says, not what somebody said, not what somebody thought it said. Now, just hold your place there, and let's go over to... Uh, I want you to see this in your Bible. If you have your Bible, I get it out. And go with me to a scripture that will help you understand this. It's Luke, the 17th chapter. And let's notice what it says here in verse 20. When he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now that ought to settle when the kingdom of God came. The kingdom of God is within you. That's where Jesus said the kingdom of God is going to dwell. The kingdom of God is within you. Now on the day of Pentecost, we know that the kingdom of God came in in its fullness. On the day of Pentecost when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, when they were born again there in the upper room, the kingdom of God come to dwell in the hearts of men. So when we look here in Revelation, it says, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Then this had to happen back there, recorded in the word of God, when the kingdom of God was established in the hearts of men. It's not something that's going to happen in the pie in the sky or when we get to heaven. This is something that has already happened. It's already come to pass. Now has come salvation. Well, ask yourself, has salvation come? Yes, salvation has come. Has strength come? Has the believer been able to resist the devil? Yes, the believer is able to resist the devil today. Then strength has come. Now, let me point out to you that under the Old Covenant, now some of you might not have realized this, but under the Old Covenant, the people did not have any power to resist the devil. Did you realize that? The only protection they had was staying in the law, keeping the law to the letter. If they got out from under God's umbrella of protection, God had, so to speak, an umbrella of protection over them, and that was for them doing the Word of God. If they didn't keep that law, then they got out from under that umbrella of protection and the curses came upon them. So there was no strength, no power under the old covenant to resist the devil. The spirit or the anointing of God only came upon the prophet, the priest, and the king under the Old Testament and under the old covenant. That's the only three that had the spirit of God. But today, every believer has the Spirit of God. So strength has come. You see, under the Old Covenant, there's no scripture in the Bible, in the Old Covenant, that said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. It was keep the Word of God. It was walk in line with God's Word. It's obey His commandments. And then you would have what was called the righteousness, which is of the law. Now, you see, the only righteousness under the law was being obedient to that law. There wasn't any other righteousness under that law. You couldn't be born again under the law. You couldn't have the strength, the power, and anointing that we have today under the law. It was just not available to you. But now has come strength and power and the kingdom of our Christ and the kingdom of our God has come. Well, when did it come? When Satan was cast out of heaven. Now, I'll tell you, when you get a hold of that, it'll help you understand some things about this, that you have power and authority over the devil. Don't give any place to the devil. The Apostle Paul said, give no place to the devil. Evidently, you can give place to the devil, or Paul wouldn't have said, don't do it. So there is that possibility of giving the devil some place. And if there is a possibility of giving the devil some place, you need to find out what gives him place. You need to find out how to keep from giving him place. And you need to find out how to activate the power of his Christ that has come to you. 
Well, that's what we're doing. We're sharing with you where the devil gets his power and how you can resist him, how you can walk in a divine flow of wisdom and knowledge and understanding in this. Because I'll tell you, God's on your side and God wants you free from the bondage of the devil. You don't have to stay under the bondage of the devil. The kingdom of our God has come and the power of the Christ is already manifest in the earth. Salvation has come. Thank God for that. Now, I'm convinced of this, that when Satan was cast down, this is when salvation came to man. Now, let's go into that just a little bit and read the other verse here. Verse 11 of Revelation chapter 12 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto the death. Now, this is not a future event to take place. This is something that has already happened in verse 10 where the accuser of the brethren is cast down, Satan is cast down to the earth, and I believe that it happened the very day that Jesus Christ ascended into the heavenlies. I'm convinced of this. Now, you can believe what you want to, but I'm just telling you what I believe about it now, that when Jesus ascended to the Father and was seated at the right hand of the Father, he cleaned out that mess up there. See, did you realize that the heavens and the earth will pass away, the Bible says? Evidently, the first heaven fell with Satan. Now, the first heaven, don't get excited about that. It's not talking about where God's throne is. It's talking about the air above the earth. This is called the lower heaven. There are three words in the Greek for heaven. One is the air above the earth. The other is the mid heavens. The other one is where God's throne is, which would be called the highest heaven. So evidently, the first heaven fell, the angels, the fallen angels, the principalities and the powers, that's where they abide. But Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. Now I want us to go to Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 2. And I want to read you what the Apostle Paul says about this. In verse 14, it says, well, let's go back to verse 13. And ye being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting and ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. Now, I want you to listen to this. He took it out of the way, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. In other words, everything. In fact, the Greek says that he removed the handwriting from the note. All of our debts were paid. Thank God. And verse 15 says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly. Now that may be a little misleading to us, maybe a little blind to us when we read that because we don't use the word spoil today the way they used it then. That word spoil simply means to strip off or to unclothe. So what Jesus actually did when he went into the regions of the damned and was in mortal combat with Satan there, he actually spoiled the principalities and powers. Now, this simply means that Jesus took authority over them, exercised authority over them, arose from the dead. They were not able to hold him, thank God. He arose from the dead, and he ascended to his Father's throne and is seated there now at the right hand of the Father. So from this scripture where he stripped off or unclothed the principalities or powers is what it says. To tell you the truth, Satan is streaking there now. He doesn't have a thing to wear. His authority is gone. I mean, it's gone. Satan's authority is gone. He does not have any authority. He's illegal on this planet. And then if you want to go just a little further with that, let's go back over to Matthew, the 28th chapter, where Jesus, standing before he ascended to the Father in verse 18 of Matthew 28, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now notice, not only power in heaven, but in earth. All power. Now if he has all power, how much does that leave the devil? Now see, remember in Romans the 13th chapter, it says there is no power but of God and those that be ordained of God. 
Now, how could Satan have power? And Jesus said, I've got it all. And then the Apostle Paul said, there is no power but those that be ordained of God. There is no power but of God. See, all governments, government is God-ordained. Now, I didn't say that the kind of governments that some people have is ordained of God. Let me, let me state that accurately. Government, though, is ordained of God. It's God's will for us to have governing rules to govern the people. That's the will of God. It actually comes from God. It comes from the Old Testament, some of the governing rules that God gave over there. I didn't say that every government is operating under biblical government. In fact, very few of them, if any of them are. I, I guess probably the United States is coming closer to it than anyone. But you see, this is from God. This dominion is from God, given to man. God gave man dominion. And it's God's will for people to live under some type of government. Now, you see, the political system of the world and the political system even of this nation does not measure up to God's standard. I'm sure of that. But yet... It is the will of God that there be governing bodies. So we should be subject to a higher power. That's what Romans the 13th chapter verse 1 says. Let everyone be subject to a higher power. In other words, the governments, the laws that are made, we should obey the laws of the land. We disagree with them. We all try to get them changed. But they're the laws of the land. Now notice here. Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So if Jesus had all the power and all the authority in heaven and earth, then they didn't leave the devil any. Well, I want you to know Satan has lost his power. He is not what he used to be. And don't get the idea that God and the devil are just so close together in power until, you know, it's just kind of nip and tuck to see who's going to win. One will win a little, the other will win a little. No, let me tell you, Satan is eternally defeated. You can mark it down now, he's eternally defeated. His defeat was prophesied in Genesis 3. And I'll tell you, it's coming to pass in this very day. Well, someone said, doesn't look like that he's losing. Well, you need to get your eyes on what God's doing. See, if you go to looking at what the devil's doing, you think, yeah, well, you know the devil's winning. But you get to looking at what God's doing, you find out God's winning. Praise the Lord. Now, as you look at this, you wonder, how in the world then could Satan have any power when Jesus had it all? Then somebody said, well, what did he do with that power? What did he do with that authority and the power that he has? Well, he delegated it to the body of Christ, to the believers there. He turned to the believers there. Now, see, the 16th chapter of Mark records this same incident, and it says that Jesus turned to the believers and says, Now, in my name, you go cast out demons. You lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You do these things in my name. Now, why would he just come from talking about authority and just go over to that? Well, because he's delegating the authority of this earth to the body of Christ. The body of Christ, now listen very closely to what I'm going to say. The body of Christ are the true church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about a denomination. God does not dwell in denominations. God dwells in the true church. You know what the church is? Have you ever seen the true church? Let me show you what a church looks like. This is a church. <laughs> this body, this body is the church of Jesus Christ. That is his church. It's considered the body of Christ. Did you know that you are the only body that Jesus Christ has on this earth today to dwell in? God does not dwell in brick buildings. He does not dwell in wood buildings. He dwells in the hearts of believers. He dwells in you. You are the church. You are the one with authority. It's not some denomination. I could care less what denomination you are. But I do care whether or not you're obeying the Word of God or made Jesus the Lord of your life. The true church is made up of a body of believers. Now, you can argue all you want to about who's in the bride and who's the bride and who's not the bride and all of that. I could care less. I'm going. 
<laughs> I'd be the custodian to the bride just to get to go, and I'm going, brother. When the rapture takes place, I'm going. You can just count on it. Well, we need to quit arguing about some of those things and get on with what the body of Christ is to do, and that's to put Satan under your feet. That's what the church is to do. God, through Jesus Christ, has given you power over the devil. And it's time you quit letting the devil run over you, run roughshod over you and steal your finances, steal your loved ones and steal this and that from you and then blame it on God and get you to bawling and squalling that, well, God did this to me. No, God didn't do it. The devil did it. But you have authority over the devil. If you'll resist the devil, he'll flee from you just like the Bible said he would. See, when we point out some of these things, some of you will be able to rise up and enter into a greater authority, an authority that you already had, dominion that you already had, but you didn't understand it. And see, if you don't understand it, you can't walk in it. Did you know that you cannot believe any further than you have knowledge? That's what's wrong with a lot of people today. They don't have enough knowledge of the Word of God to know how to believe it or to operate in it. But you see, Satan gets his power from you as a believer. That is his source of power. He is shut off from the tree of life. Did you know that? That in the Garden of Eden, that Satan didn't get to tap into that tree of life? He wanted to do it through Adam. That was his intention, was to tap into the tree of life through Adam. But thank God he didn't get to do that. God put Adam out of the garden before he was able to eat of the tree of life after he sinned. Now go with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And I want us to read from verse, well, let's start verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now see, we're talking about here, in fact, he goes on the next verse and says, neither give place to the devil. See, we're talking about not giving place to the devil. One of the ways that Satan gets his power is when you give him the power. See, there's no need of giving place to the devil. There's no need of giving your authority over to Satan. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. Neither give place to the devil. Be angry. It's all right to be angry. Just don't sin while you're angry. <laughs> I tell you, sometimes you get spiritual indignation or anger, spiritual anger. Jesus was angered sometimes. He went into that temple. Brother, I mean, he made him a whip out of cord, and he run the money changers out of the temple turned the cash register over of those people there that was making merchandise of the temple. Now, brother, you better, <laughs> you, you better have something to back it up when you go to turning folks' cash register over. You're going to get in a heap of trouble. Well, Jesus was angry, but he didn't sin. See, you don't have to sin just because you're angry. Now, notice it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, I remember a minister friend of mine said, man, he said, many is the time, many is the time that I've had to break the speed limit to get home to tell my wife, I forgive you. <laughs> I forgive you. Because, uh, you see, they'd had some words before he went to work. And, and uh, the Bible said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. He said he had to break the speed limit to get home before the sun went down a few times. In fact, he said, I'd go in and tell her, uh, you're wrong, but I forgive you. <laughs> well, that's the way most of us think the other is wrong. But now what I wanted to point out to you here is the fact that Paul says, neither give place to the devil. Now, there would be no need of the Apostle Paul saying this to you or to the church, you see, at Ephesus, which would be to us. It's written to the church, so it's written to us today. So he said, Neither give place to the devil. So this is where Satan gets a lot of his power. People give it to him. They give him place. They give him the authority. They give him the ability to operate. Now somebody said, well, how do you do that? How do you give place to the devil? Well, by becoming angry and sinning. By speaking words. That's one way you do it. Your words. By your words, you give Satan authority. You license him to bring many things to pass by your old negative, wrong thinking, and wrong speaking. You know, you get disgusted about some deal, business deal, you businessmen, and say, well, I'll tell you, that's the way it happens. Every time I nearly get this deal together, somebody throws a monkey wrench in the deal, and it all blows up in my face. Well, you just gave place to the devil. See, you may have been praying for three weeks about this, 
You may have thought you was trusting God about it. But about the time that Satan comes in, you know, and puts up a smoke screen to make it look like it's not going to come to pass, then you get all upset and begin to give the devil license to destroy the work of your hands, all that you've been working for. Now, you have to realize that your words are powerful. Your words give Satan the license to operate on those words and cause what you're saying to come to pass. The same way that God's word, when you speak God's word, confess God's word, and keep God's word in your mouth, it licenses God, gives God the freedom and the ability to come in and to cause those things to come to pass. But when you speak the words of the devil... Now, see, some of you didn't even realize that those negative things coming out of your mouth about the business deal or about your finances or about someone else is coming from the devil. You see, the things you're speaking and the thoughts you're having are either coming from God or the devil. There's no in-between. Some of you thought, well, that was just me. No, no, it was you influenced by either God or the devil. So, you see, when we act on the Word of God, we can give God credit for it. When we're speaking the things that are contrary to God's Word, we just might as well give credit where credit's due. The devil, we've licensed him to use our words and bring that thing to pass. Now, then you go to bawling and squalling, and I know what some of you are doing. Some of you right now in bad situations in your life, in your marriage, in your finances, and you're bawling and squalling because you think God's doing it. Let me tell you, it's not God doing it. It's the devil. So don't give him any place. You give him place by your words. And he operates on your words. Now let me say it this way. I'm going to say this in many ways. You're going to get it. Your words are like a warrant issued. If you speak words of doubt and unbelief, words of failure, it gives the devil a warrant to operate on that and bring it to pass. Just like if you speak words of faith, you license God with those words, it becomes his warrant to see that it comes to pass and releases your faith. When you speak negative words, you're releasing your fear and causing it to come to pass and setting it in motion and allowing the devil to move in and have place in your life. Now notice as we go on here, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. Now I like to do this and, and put a period there. I'll punctuate that, you know, just for the sake of looking at it. Let him that stole steal no more. Now, I'll tell you, if you'll do that, brother, it'll solve some situations in your life. Now, what's it saying here? I know in the context of this, this is not what it's saying. Allow me to pull that phrase out of context. Satan is the one that's stealing. Don't let him steal anymore. <laughs> Don't let him steal from you anymore. Now, let's put it into context. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now see, the context of this actually where he's using this scripture is to let him that stole steal no more, but to work with his hands. A man that's been born again, a man that's resigned the work of the devil, don't let him keep stealing. And you know, you wouldn't think that anybody that were born again, any Christian would steal, would you? But yet you find some people. You know, there's some kooky Christians going around the country. Yeah, you heard me right. There's a few kooky Christians. I call them granola Christians. The reason I call them granola Christians is because a granola bar is made up of fruits, nuts, and flakes. And there's a few nuts and flakes floating around the country calling themselves Christians. And one individual, now let me just give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. As one individual said, uh, well, you know, the Bible says all things are yours. So they took that literally to themselves and said, well, all things are mine. So they just pick up things and take them with them, just steal things. Say, well, the Bible said all things are mine. Now, you know that <laughs> a guy like that, you wonder when he gets up in the morning, you wonder how he ever finds the floor. I mean, people that pull that out of there. Well, that's what I'm talking about, kooky things, you see, that Christians will do. You wouldn't think anybody would steal. But the Apostle Paul writes this to the church and says, Let him that stole steal no more. Let him labor working with his hands. So they'd have something to give. Now, see, this is the way God's system works. You work, you give, and it'll return to you. You'll get a better job. You'll get a better pay. So he said, just let him work. Let him work. <laughs> Some people think manual labor is the president of Mexico, you know, but it's not. That means to just get at it, Mac, and go to work. 
and said, let him work so that he'd have something to give. And see, this is the way God's system works. You work, you give, and it'll return to you. You'll get a better job. You'll get a better pay. So he said, just let him work. Let him work. And look at verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now see how he ties this with this giving no place to the devil. Don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Just grit your teeth and hold it in there. I know sometimes you just want to say, make a bad confession. There's been times, a lot of times, after I even got in the Word of God, where I wanted to make a bad confession. Just wanted to say, oh, none of it's working. Dear Lord, I, you know, what am I going to do? Just have to grit your teeth. You just grit your teeth and don't say anything. And some of you need to learn the vocabulary of silence. Are you listening to me? Learn the vocabulary of silence. When you can't make a good faith statement, just keep your mouth shut. Because some of your problem is just one inch below your nose. One inch. Just measure one inch below your nose. It'll come out right there every time. Right in your mouth. That's some of your problem. You're giving place to the devil with your mouth. You're speaking words that he's operating on, causing fear to come. When you speak those words, cause fear to come. When fear comes, faith leaves you. Faith and fear won't dwell in the same heart. They depart from one another. Don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Now just stop and ask yourself this. When you get ready to say something critical about somebody or say something negative, stop and ask yourself, will this minister grace to the hearer? And somebody said, well, it might depend on who hears it. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. I know one person that's going to hear everything you say. In fact, I know two. God and you are going to hear it. But I'll tell you, the things you're speaking is going to affect you more than it's going to affect God. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. You shouldn't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edifying that it may minister grace to the hearer. You are the number one hearer of what you say. Do you ever realize that? And if you don't realize it, you need to realize it now because the words you speak have more effect on you probably than anyone else. The words you speak. Now see, we've talked a little bit about images. Some of you have got the wrong image of the devil because you've heard wrong and spoken wrong. Some of you have the wrong image of yourself because you've been deceived about the things of God and what the promises of God's Word says. Somebody's told you, well, that's not for us today, and you don't have any authority. <laughs> like one individual that I heard. The man said, why, we don't have authority in the earth. He said, Adam, when Adam was put here on earth, said all he was was a weed puller <laughs> in the garden. <laughs> Can you imagine a man saying that? that Adam was nothing but a weed puller. He was God of the world. He was God of the world. Adam was put here to be God over the earth. But you see, some people don't understand that. See, there was no weeds in the garden when Adam was here. When Adam was first put in the garden, God created him, put him there, there was no weeds in the garden. They didn't come until after Adam sinned. So Adam couldn't have been a weed puller until after he sinned because there was no weeds to pull. There was no thorns in there. There was nothing, you see, that it hurt or destroyed. Now, it's kind of like this, and someone said it. I've probably mentioned it before, but it bears repeating again. I'm going to tell it again because I want to hear it myself. <laughs> it's like the fellow that was at the business, and the guy called up and said, uh, I want to talk to someone with a little authority around there. He said, uh, well, go ahead and talk to me. I've got about as little as anybody. Well, I see that's the way we've been. We've always thought about, well, you know, we just don't have any authority. We're just here on earth. We just have to fold our hands and just let come what will. No, no, thank God we don't have to do that. And if you've been doing that, that's part of your problem. No, your corrupt communication that comes out of your mouth gives place to the devil. That's where Satan is getting his power. Now, I'll tell you, he's getting most of his power from that source right there. The most powerful thing that Satan can tap is your tongue. That's why the scripture says, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Now, you remember what God said to Joshua? He said, let not the book of the law depart out of your mouth. 
Now, that doesn't mean don't speak it out of your mouth. That means to keep on speaking it in that instance there in Joshua 1, 8. Don't let the Word of God depart out of your mouth. See, that's all the Word of God they had. But meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe, do all that's written therein, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. How? By speaking the good things. So then, you see, the things you speak release some of the most powerful forces in the universe. And that is the force of faith or the force of fear. Now, both of them are spiritual forces. You need to know that. That's why he's telling you here, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth because it'll change the image or put an image inside you that'll see yourself failing. Proverbs says, a good word spoken in due season is good for the bones, health to the bones, you see. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Well, words will make your spirit merry. And a broken spirit drieth the bones. Well, there's power there. See, your spiritual forces you're releasing out of your mouth. So don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Notice it says that it may minister grace to the hearer. You are the one hearing the words you speak. And they're causing you to have an image inside you. Either an image that lines up with the Word of God or lines up against the Word of God. That's why it's so important. Now go on to verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit of God. Now what grieves the Spirit of God? Evidently corrupt communication that comes out of your mouth. Grieves the Holy Spirit of God. So he said, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to edifying that may minister grace to the hearer, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Now there are other ways. Certainly there are other ways you could grieve the Spirit of God. So this is the way you give place to the devil. This is where Satan gets his power by you grieving the Spirit of God, by you speaking things that are contrary to the Word of God out of your mouth. Now it says, let all bitterness and all wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Now here's another one that will absolutely give Satan power over you and give him authority as you get in unforgiveness and won't forgive somebody over something they've done to you. Somebody say, yes, but Brother Caps, you don't know what Brother so-and-so or Sister so-and-so said or did to me. <laughs> no, I don't know, and I don't care. I don't even want to hear about it. I just know that you better forgive them just like Christ forgave you. Now, whatever it was, wasn't any worse than what you've done. <laughs> and so don't give any place to the devil. The Apostle Paul, speaking of this in one place, says, Forgive lest Satan get advantage of us. Now, you see, don't give Satan any advantage. Now, some of you have allowed that to come to pass. You've allowed Satan to get advantage of you because you would not forgive others. Now, if you forgive, Christ will forgive you. You see, 1 John 1, 9 says, We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Satan can gain authority over you and power over you and tap into your authority if you don't forgive others. Now, let me show you how. Because the Bible also says, if you don't forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. That's what Jesus said. Your heavenly Father won't forgive you unless you forgive your brother his trespasses. Now, see, if you're perfect, never made any mistakes, you might get by with that all right. But since you're not perfect, since you have made a few mistakes, you have made a few mistakes, hadn't you? <laughs> now, if you write me and tell me you hadn't, we're going to pray for liars. <laughs> because everybody's made mistakes. So if you don't forgive, you can't get forgiven for your mistakes. And then condemnation gets on you. I mean like ugly on an ape, and you can't get rid of it, brother, until you forgive. And so you give place to the devil, and you allow the devil to get authority over you. Now whose authority is it? It's your authority. It's your power. But Satan comes in and steals it from you. He usurps your authority because you gave place to the devil because you wouldn't forgive somebody that did something to you. Now I know I'm on some of your toes, but I'm just going to stand there a while because I tell you what, God will heal your toes. I'm telling you something that will get you out of bad situations. 
forgive, let it slip. I mean, let it slide, man. Forgive them of what they've done. Don't stand there and say, bless God, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm just going to go on. I'll never forget that, and I'll hold it against them the rest of my life. Well, you may not have long to hold it against them because your life may be cut short because you would not forgive. Now, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you something here. <laughs> We're getting into some things to make your hair stand up like mine, but I'm telling you the truth. It may shorten your life. Your life can be shortened by words, not forgiving people. Unforgiveness is a thief of faith, and it's a thief of life. So Satan gets his power by you committing sin. He gets his power by you giving him place. He doesn't have any authority. He doesn't have any ability over you or power over you. The Apostle Paul said, sin shall not have dominion over you. Listen, if sin doesn't have dominion over you, Satan doesn't have dominion over you. But the instant that sin has dominion over you, then Satan's going to take dominion over you. I mean, he doesn't have any right to do it, but he'll come in and do it if you're foolish enough to operate in that. But you see, 1 John 1, 9 will cure all of that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Somebody said, yeah, but Brother Caps, you just said that he won't forgive us unless we forgive. Well, he said he's faithful and just. God would be unjust if he forgave you of your mistakes when you won't forgive other people of their mistakes. Are you listening to what I'm saying now? I'm telling you something that will help you. So he said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Well, thank God he has. That's the good news. Christ has forgiven you, so forgive others the same way Christ has forgiven you, and don't give any place to the devil. I want to read something that the Apostle Paul said, and we're going to talk about it for a little bit. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, I want us to read from verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, here's where Satan gets some of his power. is when a person that names the name of Jesus then does not depart from iniquity. He gains power and authority over that individual. Now, where does he get it? Somebody said, well, the devil just has great power. No, no, no. Now, wait a minute. He got it from that individual because this opens the door to the devil and gives him authority that is really not his. You remember what Paul said? Sin shall not have dominion over you. So here he says to them, let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord Jesus Christ depart from iniquity. When a person tries to hold on to sin and iniquity and hold on to God with one hand, they're over in the devil's territory. You're over there where Satan can bring the curses. And this is where Satan gets his power over individuals. And see, an individual like that, somebody hears about, well, you know, brother so-and-so, yeah, he was born again. He was a good man. But you see, there might have been some iniquity in his life that people didn't know about. And yet he's seemingly outwardly going to church, paying his tithes, doing all the good outward things. But yet the man has regarded iniquity in his heart. He's not given up the things that are of the devil. He's over in the devil's territory. And what happens is that opens the door to the devil, gives him authority there. The man gave him authority. He comes in, spoils the man's household, may steal his family, may cause the man to lose his life. No telling what will happen out of the situation. Then somebody says, wonder why God allowed that to happen. He was such a good man. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of good people, all right, that regard iniquity in their heart and don't depart from evil. Now, see, just because a person's born again does not mean they can't sin. You could. Now, let's go on with it. There's some more things here I want to bring out. It says here in verse 20, But in a great house there is not only vessels of gold or silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now, notice what it said for him to do. If any man, therefore. Now, notice. 
if a man therefore purge himself from these things. Now, this is not something God does. Somebody said, well, God's purging us through something that he sent your way. No, now, wait a minute. He said for the man to purge himself of these things. Get rid of these things yourself. Judge yourself. Now, I'm telling you how to stop Satan from having power over you and stop Satan from gaining your authority and your power is to judge yourself. Go to the Word of God and judge yourself. If you will judge yourself as a Christian, you will not be judged. Now, I know some of you think, well, where in the world do you find that? In 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, the Apostle Paul says, we judge ourselves. Before you take the Lord's Supper, judge yourself. In fact, you, you could do this daily. Sit down and take the Bible. This is why you should meditate the Word of God day in and day out. Because when you sit down and go to reading and meditating the Scriptures and dwelling on it, the Holy Spirit will quicken things to you and say, now, you know, here's a Scripture that you're not living up to. <laughs> and you sit down there and judge yourself. Yeah, I, I can understand that. You know, a lot of times I read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and, man, just sit down there and judge myself over that. See, that's the love chapter said if a man had faith to move mountains and has not love, it benefits it or profits him nothing. And he said even if he gives away all of his money and gives his body to be burned, he said it profit him nothing. Well, it'd profit those he gave it to, but it wouldn't profit him. Now, what we're talking about here, you see, is falling into line with what the Word of God says, judge yourself according to the Word of God. If you don't judge yourself, you're giving place to the devil because it gives him a foothold in your life. Now, some of you haven't realized this, and this is where Satan gained a foothold. The Bible says, He that hideth his sin shall not prosper. Now, brother, you judge yourself. I'm not going to judge you. And you know, there ought not any other Christian judge you. But you judge yourself from the Word of God. The Bible says if you'll judge yourself, then you won't be judged. If you judge yourself and say, Well, yeah, I've sinned there. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me this sin. Brother, you can stop sin right in its track. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is not something that God's going to do. This is something you do yourself. Now, notice that it goes on here and says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Uh, avoid arguments at all cost. Don't argue about religion. <laughs> now, you can, you can get in more trouble over that than you know what to do with knowing that they do gender strife. But the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Now, he's telling you what the servant of the Lord must. Be gentle to all men, apt to teach patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, listen to this. Instruct those that oppose themselves. Did you know that many people today are opposing themselves because they don't understand the Bible? They're releasing unseen forces out of their mouth that actually oppose them in every inch of the way that they try to make progress. Their words and the spiritual forces that come out of their mouth are opposing them. They are opposing themselves. Their words are contrary to the Word of God. They're praying for prosperity and confessing that they have lack every day. Now you're praying and you're saying, we'll have to get together, or are you going to nullify your praying with your saying? And you nullify your saying with your praying. So get them both together. Get your act together and follow the precept of God's Word. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now listen to what he said. Peradventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now what is truth? The truth is the Word of God. Now there is no absolute truth outside of God's Word. God's Word is the absolute truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now notice that they may recover themselves. Now some of you have been wanting for somebody to pray the prayer of faith for you, somebody to recover you out of the snare of the devil. Well now through intercession and praying, you can do a certain amount of that. You can stand in the gap. You can make up the hedge for people. But here he's telling, Paul is telling us, you're going to have to do something. 
In other words, the Bible said, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now, it didn't say for me to resist the devil for you, and he would flee from me for you. That's not what it said. Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Didn't say he'd flee from me because I talked to him about you. <laughs> now, see, I can exercise dominion over Satan where I'm concerned, where my family's concerned. But when it comes to exercising my authority over the devil for you, there's some places that you just get in trouble doing that. Now, what I'm talking about is you just can't get it to work every time for somebody else. It'll always work for you. And if you learn how to work it, it'll work for you. Now, notice it says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now, if you're in that situation and allowing the devil given him place through the fact that you're not purging yourselves of iniquity and you're not setting yourself upon the word of God and hearing what God has said to you about certain situations in your life. You see, God will talk to you through his word. That's the way God talks to you. And the Holy Spirit will convince you that you're wrong in a certain area. But it's up to you to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. There's some of you right now that you're walking in known sin then you've been bawling, squalling, wondering why things have been happening the way they have when you've been hiding your sin, you've been walking in known sin. Well, you're going to have to purge yourself of that. You've opened the door to the devil. Now, don't blame God for that. God didn't have anything to do with that. You invited the devil in. You're going to have to recover yourself out of that. You've got to get on your knees and repent of it. Repent, change your mind, decide to follow God in the direction of God and decide to resist the devil instead of butting up with him. Now, that's where some of you missed it. Instead of resisting, you just buddy up with him, just go to saying everything the devil said. <laughs> I know how you do. Now, some of you think, well, how in the world does he know so much of that? I know because I've been there. And I know because I don't want to be there no more. See, you can resist the devil. You can resist him on every hand. The problem is some of you hadn't submitted yourself to God. You don't want to resist the devil. And therefore, he doesn't flee from you because you didn't resist him, didn't want to resist him. I'll tell you what, God will come to your aid. Let me tell you something, folks. God is on your side. God's not against you. He's for you. But you're going to have to line up with the Word of God to get these things to work for you. And when you do, they'll work for you and they'll bring victory to your house.